Sunday Too Far Away, which I actually watched again recently with some students. Good picture. Jack was good, wasn't he? Uh, one of Jack's first starring roles, along with Peterson. Yeah. And again, Peterson, that was uh, Jack Thompson again. Again, that was... Again, Burstall. That's right, Jim sure. Burstall. Sunday Too Far with a, Away. With a naked Wendy Hughes. Always a good thing. Absolutely. <laughs> in, a, in a prime. <laughs> I, I heard her do an interview you now, and she said, and she was, I forget who she was talking about, she said, in those, in those days... You always had to be naked now and again. Oh, Alvin Purple, as we know, was full of, you know, yeah. every big Australian actress in the time was naked in the Alvin <laughs> Purple film. Well, yeah. Jackie go. Weaver was in there after all. Jack, oh, t- let me tell you something about Jackie Weaver and Wendy Hughes and those girls. You're talking about it was, a, it was a new time. It was all exciting. When they came in to do their dollar, we called it looping in those days, which they called ADR. The which, post-sync, and yeah. It, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't genuine ADR, even though we set it up, because we had the ability to, to lengthen the the end or the start of it, ADR, genuine ADR then, as in Hollywood, it started recording on, you know, six foot eight frames and ended on 11 foot six frames and yeah, so, so on. so you're watching your image and you're talking in sync with your lips to yes, get better quality yes, sound from Yes, yes, sure, I'm sorry, sure. The girls were fantastic. Um, they worked so well and they were so good at it. Um, and, and I remember Judy Morris was in a film that I, that I mixed and she was doing ADR and it, I thought, it might have been. Um, it might have been in search of Anna, and you know, um, we did a, about three hours work, and and her, her synchronisation was great, you know. And eventually, I played one back, and she said, "Can I play it back with the with, so that that comes through the earphones?" And I said, "What do you mean?" She said, "I haven't been hearing them yet." <laughs> I said, "Gee, you see, <laughs> she's doing it totally silent." She was. She was looking at it, and she was fantastic. I said, "Oh." I was so apologetic, but I didn't, I didn't know. She Usually they'd say, yeah. mate, I can't hear this. Yeah. She assumed that's the way you did it at that time. And But those girls, um, they were much better than the guys, by the way, at posting dialogue. Um, and they actually worked harder than the, than the guys at posting dialogue. I'm I've not saying found... the guys were no good at it, but the girls, were, they, they were so oh, conscientious. It was fantastic. Mm. I've always found actors that um, have a good sense of rhythm and musicality, mm. whether they're a singer or not, uh, tend to be very good at looping ADR. That's they, true. They get, there's a That's rhythm true. to it and trying to get back into that groove. It is a rhythm thing. Usually when, when the, the line gets out of sync, it's not because the words are wrong, it's because the pauses are wrong. Mm. Often in a sentence, you'll pause for a fraction longer than normal. And I mean, that, even when I said that, often in a sentence, you'll pause if I were to, to, to post sync that line of dialogue, the most important thing is the gap I make between the word sentence and the pause. Uh, if I say often in a sentence, you'll pause, I can say often in a sentence the same way a hundred times, but I can't lose, leave, leave exactly the gap before I say you pause yeah. before the next line. And, and that's, that was the secret of posting dialogue, was the, the rhythm that they got. So they knew what the pauses were, and the girls were fantastic at it. Judy, um, Judy Morris was good. Um, Wendy was good. Uh, Weaves was good. Uh, Helen Morse, who did Caddy, was marvellous. And Caddy's coming up. Um, but, uh, uh, having yeah. watched Sunday Too Far Away recently, and I do notice that there was some ADR there. Yeah. Tell me about, in these days, in the mid-70s, the challenge of trying to match looped dialogue with location sound. Because you didn't have the EQs and the facilities we have now and the noise reduction that we have now. Well, no, you didn't have noise reduction, that's for sure. What we did do was what uh, Glenn Glenn had done. <clears throat> Ron had seen this. Uh, there was, he had built this triangular uh, thing like on a column and it had cork on this surface, cork with holes on it, another surface, and a sharp surface, and that was stood by the actors and when we had a, a live sound, as in a, a live room like this, for instance, we would have the sharp surface uh, facing the actor. Mm-hmm. And it sounded different if we turned that around and had the cork surface, which absorbed the sound. Get more dead sound. So we had that, which was a, a bit of a help. And then we had... Um, kind of a natural reverb you're creating there. Sure, yeah. sure. Uh, uh, a natural ambience that like, mm. obviously, if, if, I mean, if you walk... If you walk into the loo, as you walk into the loo, the whole thing sounds different as you yeah. take a step, doesn't it? So we were doing our best to do that. We did have a couple of good reverb units, one of which was a, was a very expensive one that, that, was come, that came out from Hollywood. Now in the 70s, we're talking plate reverbs mostly? Yes, we are, yep. 
Yep. There was, um, when I worked at Supreme Sound, I go back again now to about 1959 or 60, there was a long, long plate reverb, which was, it must have been, oh gee, 10 or 12 feet long, and as thick as that, and stood as high as a bar. And um, Merv Murphy was such a clever guy, he got a message that this, had, that this thing had come out, it was the only one in Australia, it had come out for the ABC, and they dropped it unloading it. Uh -huh. And it had a remote um, uh, control on it that you could alter the level, the, the length of the reverb, yeah. and the remote was broken. He went like a rocket and he bought that for a few hundred dollars because the ABC got another one. And we used that at, at Supreme, but you had to, at, on the top of it was a, a wheel, a bit. You'd be manually adjusting we it. We would manually <laughs> adjust it. You had to walk 15 meters, so what? How's that, how's that sound? What do we think, Paul? A bit longer, okay, mate? Boom. And we use that, but but they had a. We had another one at at United, which wasn't the same as that, but it was a long plate reverb thing. It was beautiful sounding echo. It was just beautiful. You know? So in things like, uh, I mentioned Sunday too far away because a lot of it was outdoors. Sure. A lot of, it's out in the desert. It's out in the sure. scrub, and there's a lot of outdoor <laughs> scenes there. Sure. How much of films of this period were? How much looping were you doing? Oh, gee, it depended on. Um, on location, obviously, but we we kept looping to a minimum because, as you say, if you if you did an outdoor scene, you couldn't just do one bloke in the three generally. So that meant three artists came in, mm. and in those days, budgets were so so strict, so tight. I mean, um, I remember a film, the first film that that cost five hundred thousand dollars to make. The whole film, I mean, five hundred and forty grand it cost, and there was. <gasps> See, what did that cost? It's outrageous. It was outrageous. And then it was a Bruce Beresford film. I can't remember the one it was. Anyway, when Tim did Eliza Fraser, they got to a million dollars. People said, oh, that's ridiculous. It was, it was advertised, our first million dollar movie. Exactly. Yeah. So the budgets were tight. So I would say to them, look, if you're going to loop Phil in this scene, um, you'll have to do the three of us or... It's gonna make I'll make it as good as I can, but I can't guarantee it's gonna sound yeah, great. Yeah, if you're gonna loop, do the whole scene just to Ab keep it consistent. Absolutely, yeah. the, the the three artists exactly. Even though only this guy's got problems. Only, yes, exactly. You know? and so, so so one of the one of the arts that one of the dialogue mixers' great skills was to rescue as much original dialogue as possible. Right. Yes. And that was a big skill. And so how much, uh, did you do much location sound recording in your time? No, uh, no, no, I did none on features, but I did, I, I understood it um, because I'd done some when we were doing commercials at, at uh, our trans and also. So like, I, I can imagine, because I've done this, mm. sitting in there trying to mix and swearing at the guy that did the location sound, just oh. screwing it up. <laughs> Don't forget, radio mics arrived then. And the radio mics, some of them were pretty ordinary, I'll tell you. And, and if you put a radio mic on one guy and the other guy's got ordinary, you know, dynamic microphones, oh, it was, it was really difficult. Although not often they do that. But there was one film I mixed, one film, where the radio mic things were just not good enough. And we looped the entire movie. Mm. It was a Jimmy Sharman picture called Summer of Secrets. Oh, yeah. And this I is before Rocky Horror. Yeah, yeah. and I thought, uh, well, I think it was. I was I'm, not, I'm not even sure, oh. <laughs> but, but it was a Jimmy picture. And um, it had a, a, a dark actor guy. He's, he was a, a Rufus, his name was. He was an American um, actor. And I remember the first line in the film was, she always smelled a jasmine. I've always remembered that name, <laughs> jasmine. <laughs> um, um, and it had... Um, Arthur Dignam in it, hmm. and Dignam was making a movie in the movie of his life. This was part of the thing on this really strange island, and these kids had gone on some sort of adventure, and they finished up there, and they were captured there essentially. Anyway, I thought a whole film loop dialogue. How, None of us sounded usable. How easy is this going to be? That's right. We looped the entire movie. It was the hardest bloody picture ever mixed because Jimmy wanted to sound like it was all original. Hmm. He, now, I mean, loop dialogue now in a film, everybody accepts. I just think they accept anything now. If it's, if it's close enough, it's, you know, it's good enough, and, and sync-wise, especially as half the stuff you see. Live isn't in sync anymore. <laughs> I mean, I went and watched cricket tests in England three years ago, 
and interviewed the bloke, uh, the captain after the after the game, and he was standing there, and on the screen he was out of sync, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and you understand how that. No, happens. the internet we got used to latency and delays. <laughs> exactly, but what I'm saying is this was so hard because there were stuff. Some of the stuff was in in, in a cave, um, big open rooms outside. How do you simulate those reverbs? Well, you, well it was yeah. impossible. It was the hardest film I ever, ever mixed. And I had two reverb units, a little, little short one and, the, and this lovely long plate thing. And I had, you know, some equalizers. See, nowadays that's possible. Digitally, that's, and I won't go into how, but sure. you know, nowadays you can recreate any reverb, any Absolutely. natural reverb. Absolutely. Absolutely. Couldn't do it then. When I look at a film from this era, and I, it's hard for me to pick mm. the location sound and the ADR. Sure. It's, it's, you've done a brilliant job to actually get them to match.